Good morning. Welcome back to the broadcast for Timer Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, January 28th, 2023. And our top story today, Secure Saturday incentives for employers and employees to participate in startup retirement plans. And joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, John Faustino is with Broadridge and Mike Griffin with UBS. John, Mike, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Absolutely. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. And we're going to, this show is dedicated to really breaking down some of the provisions around the SECURE Act are over 90. John, um, let's talk to you first about, are there incentives for small business owners to launch their own plans wrapped into this bill? Yeah, there, there absolutely are incentives. There's credits for the administrative fees associated with small plans, and it can really be a great tool for small business owners to attract and retain existing talent. So the, the government is certainly looking at this as an opportunity to encourage saving among a group of employees that have not historically had access to retirement savings plans. And, and, and Mike, is it... We've been talking a lot since the original Secure, Secure OG, about PEPs. And we've also talked about MEPs. MEPs have been around for a long time. Is it MEPs, PEPs, or, or maybe even some of these auto IRA programs? Look, it's a number of different things, Jeff. And in fact, if you take a look at the opportunity for, for people like myself that have been in the retirement plan business for 25 years, this is the greatest opportunity for retirement plans that that I have ever seen. Just going back to, you know, what John was saying about the about the incentives to start a plan, which essentially would make a plan zero cost for someone um, starting up a plan. And then you take that in coordination with with all of the provisions and encouraging savings, and then on top of that with state mandates. This is uh, this is the best time that I have personally ever seen in the retirement plan market. And John, just coming back to you, I mean, Mike looks at it from his perspective as a retirement plan advisor, consultant, however you want to, it's got, it, there's a lot of definitions for what Mike does, all good, by the way, but what's the, what's the real opportunity if you're a retirement plan provider out there watching this program today, you're reading the Secure Act 2.0, what's the opportunity in terms of the number of plans that are out there? Well, I think there's there's going to be hundreds of thousands of new plans created. I completely agree with Mike. I think this is an incredible opportunity for financial professionals. And I would say, um, and I know Mike Mike agrees with this, it's not just the, the legacy retirement plan specialist, but generalist advisors really have an opportunity to embrace Secure 2.0 to help further the cause of getting more folks exposure to retirement plan accounts and to help themselves potentially on the wealth side as well. A lot of the folks that run these small businesses are entrepreneurs that are that are great wealth prospects or might even be wealth clients. So I think there's a great crossover opportunity here for for folks to take advantage of. And, and Mike, yeah, just let me add a little color to that, Jeff. Sure, go ahead, so Mike. Think about the pure number. You know, the 401k market right now, there's 600,000 401ks that exist as we speak. That represents about $8 trillion worth of assets in these plans. Now, 600,000 sounds like a lot, but there are 31 million business owners in the United States. So there's still a huge gap in the amount of uh, retirement plans that are existing versus ones that need to be created. And, and to that point, Mike, there's somewhere in the neighborhood, close to 70 million Americans that do not have access to a workplace retirement plan, whether it's the auto IRA plan, whether it's a PEP, whether it's just a small plan. I mean, that, there are still a lot of underserved people. And from what we can tell from any survey you look, like, look at, people want, I'm talking about regular people, just want an opportunity to save and want that the 401k or the 401k type plan seems like a really good avenue to do that. Yeah, it's an unbelievable avenue to do that. In fact, let me add some color to that. I mean, if you think about you know, just the statistic that you mentioned, that's a third of the country that does not have access to a retirement plan. Now let's talk about the people that do have access to a retirement plan. Of the two thirds that just have access, 
only 51% of those people are participating. And of the 51% that are participating, the average balance is $106,000. That's not enough to retire off of, $106,000. That's why we see legislation like the SECURE Act. That's why we see legislation like state mandates, because we need to encourage savings or, or else we're gonna have a bigger crisis on our hands. Well, John, let me come back to you because with the SECURE Act being enacted and the effective dates are in 2023 and beyond, is this really a great opportunity for the generalist financial advisor to get into the retirement industry? I think it's a huge opportunity for generalist advisors, Jeff. And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of new plans that are going to be created based on SECURE 2.0 and also these state mandates. So the 30 or so thousand retirement plan specialists that are out there and active today just are are, are not likely going to have the bandwidth to address all of these new retirement plan needs. We're also seeing a big convergence of retirement plan advising and wealth advising. So it's both an opportunity for generalist advisors to get involved with plans and kind of go the other way. There's, There's a lot of retirement plan advisors that are now mining participant data for wealth opportunities. So it makes sense that wealth advisors would go the other way to try to get um, some, some of those revenues on the, on the retirement plan side. And then it's also a bit of a defensive play for them as well too, because if you manage someone's individual wealth and they own a small business and you don't help them with their startup plan needs, someone else is gonna do it. Um, and, and those individuals that are going for those startup plans are likely doing it with a land and expand mentality where they want to win that plan initially and then transition over to the wealth after that. Yeah, really good point. Mike, you know, you mentioned 25 years in the retirement industry. You spent a lot of time as a retirement plan advisor. Do you want to talk a little about the the learning curve? Uh, what does it take to become, uh, go from a generalist advisor or someone who is just is working on financial plans to, to learning the acumen and, and the technical aspects that go into what you do as a retirement plan advisor? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, if you use the the tools that were out there, we're talking about the tools that John has. If you look at just educating yourself on this, we have the implementation of things like MEPS and PEPS that allow you to put small plans into a big plan. You have training that's out there, but it, it, it's a growth opportunity and something that advisors want to be a part of. Um, just as we were we were talking about. And if you think about that aspect, um, going back, just looking at it from the wealth management, it's completely different than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, companies were saying, you know, don't talk to my employees, we, you know, we don't need it. And now it's completely different where they're saying, we need your help. We need you to help me attract and retain my employees. In fact, 87% of employees said that they're going through some type of financial stress. And that's what we have the ability to do on the wealth management side. And from that, you know, we've seen, uh, because of that, we've seen a significant number of wealth management clients come to these generalist advisors, come to these specialist advisors, all because our clients are now asking. In fact, Jeff, there was a recent study going that went out to plan sponsors and those plan sponsors, 47% of them, 47% said this year they will be looking to switch advisors because their advisor does not help them with wealth management. That's John, I what cut clients are asking and, and I, needing us to help with this day. Yeah, I apologize, Mike. I didn't mean to step on you and interrupt you. John, I want to just talk about the educational opportunities and you and the Broadridge and the FI360 team, you had the AIF designation, but you also do a lot of webinars and education for advisors. What's the opportunity out there for more education for these generalists that we're talking about? We've, we've already done a couple of webinars on Secure 2.0. All the webinars that we do offer CE credit for our AIF designation that you mentioned. So folks can go to FI360.com and they can look at those webinars for free. We don't charge anything for them. I'm doing a, another webinar on Secure 2.0 with Bonnie Trichel and Blaine Aiken on January 31st. And I'm doing one with Paychecks on February 9th through wealthmanagement.com. I'm really excited about that. In that webinar, we're gonna take a deeper dive into a lot of the items that Mike and I have spoken about today. Yeah, well, education is so important in what we do and the rules are changing 
all the time. Very important to stay up to date. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. John Faustino, Mike Griffin, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, John and Mike. Great to see you. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. This week, we discussed how real estate is continuing its growth and expansion in defined contribution plans. Let's take a look. So I what we're seeing is that diversification has become key in the market that we're in today. And investors are looking beyond the traditional stock and bond portfolios for tools to navigate, really a market characterized by increased volatility, slowing growth, and significant inflationary pressures, all presenting risk for successful retirement outcomes. And as a result, DC investors are recognizing the benefits of including public and private real estate in retirement plans, and the market is demonstrating momentum and growth. If we look over the last, I would say, 17 years, the growth has been focused on the institutional plans, and that has truly ranged corporate plans, public plans, other, but plans that are managing multi-asset portfolios. And they're including an allocation to private and public real estate in these portfolios with the goal of strengthening their outcomes. If you look at target date funds today, target date funds that include an exposure to private and public real estate actually are demonstrating stronger returns and stronger retirement balances compared to target date funds that do not include real estate. And if you think about the market environment that we're in, as we're moving to the potential of a recession and the risks that that presents, it's likely that those target date funds that include the stabilizing, diversifying benefits of private real estate will continue to benefit their participants' outcomes through a correction and as you move into the growth cycle afterwards. 
The 2022 survey reported that 79 billion was invested in DC private real estate. And even though that represents just under 5% of the broader private real estate market, it represents a small but growing allocation to the asset class. On the other side of that, that's not invested in the 5% is defined benefit. But what's important to consider is the shift today from defined benefit to defined contribution, where defined contribution plans have become the foundation of retirement security for the majority of US employees, largely replacing defined benefit plans and shifting much of the investment decision-making and risk-taking to the participant. So it's imperative that DC plan sponsors offer well-diversified solutions that include private real estate that can support stronger outcomes across all market cycles. Today, there is a range of DC real estate solutions in the market, and it's up to the plan sponsor to define the benefits and the liquidity that they need within their plan and the way that they operate. Also, the fees that they're willing to pay to access these benefits. And I think first and foremost, it's defining what they need and then recognizing that the benefits that best address DC plan needs are solved by an allocation predominantly to private real estate with a smaller allocation to REITs. And it is their decision whether they would like to access that in one vehicle that includes public and private real estate. If you look at the growth in those types of vehicles today, the number of vehicles on the market has doubled over the last 10 years. Or plan sponsors can access those benefits directly by holding private real estate and REITs separately. And the rebalancing and the liquidity will be up to them. At the end of the day, liquidity remains critical. And I think that is especially highlighted in 2020 if we look at the market and in 2022. With real estate strong outperformance in a broader market, broader market environment that remains volatile. And real estate managers need to be able to satisfy investor liquidity needs and deliver the benefits of private market real estate. It is no longer a barrier to entry and the market has demonstrated that it can satisfy and deliver and address investors' liquidity needs during all environments. It, if you look at the funds today, the re DC real estate funds, the average allocation to public market securities is around 11.5%. But it's not just the liquid part of that real estate allocation that's important. It's also the guidelines around the daily, weekly, quarterly liquidity, which ranges, if you look at the survey, 5 to 30%. And the continued growth of the market is also a testament to the evolution and that managers have structured the products to solve for investors' liquidity needs. I agree with that. I think there's many examples of how different investors include real estate. There's different options, and it serves as an educational tool for those investors looking to enter the market because the benefits have also demonstrated within funds today and will continue going forward. And we also discussed the true cost of financial illiteracy. Let's take a look. Yeah, well, I have three decades experience in financial services. I have, uh, in, uh, what I mean by that is financial industry, mortgage, financial service industry, my first 15 years. I've been in uh, financial education for over 15 years now. And I can tell you that it is very pervasive. And what drove me here was in my time in financial services, I would get questions from people that had absolutely no idea on the basics of their finances. Uh, I would fix them up financially and six months, 12 months later, they would come back in a bad position once again. So I saw this epidemic really taking place with people. And it really stems to, I, I can think back to my own issues, right? Coming out of high school, going into college, I got into those basic issues too. And I see a lot of illiteracy uh, is carried over from lack of knowledge from when we're a child. Nobody's teaching it. It's not taught. And we have all these bad influencers, advertisers, you know, the social influencers as well, really driving this consumerism behavior, which is fine if you have the money. But when you're living paycheck to paycheck or less, uh, that's where illiteracy can really take its toll. And again, I've seen it uh, on a wide scale from the very low level of impact on somebody's life 
to completely devastating somebody's current life and their future outlook. It's a sentiment survey. So basically we ask people, how much do you feel personally you lost last year due to your lack of knowledge about personal finances? So this is their own rating that they've given themselves. And the numbers this year are the highest that we've seen since this, we started the survey six years ago. The average person has lost, according to them, average of uh, 1800 and. $19, right? And we're using the low end of, of that, uh, uh, the numbers that we provided. So it is scary, but I think these numbers may be actually underestimated. And the reason I say that is I see all the time two main things that, that happen when I talk with people about their finances. One, they're overconfident about their financial situation. They think they're in a better situation. So like a basic question as a coach or in the financial service that I have some light conversation initially, how's your credit? How's your debt? How's your overall finances? They'd be like, oh, my credit's good. Uh, I have a few credit cards with some debt on it, but overall pretty good. And you would see their credit report. 600 credit score. You would see that they have three credit cards with 20 grand a piece on it wasn't as they portrayed. So that overconfidence, I think, is one factor that might be lowering these numbers. Uh, the second is they just don't know what they don't know. They don't know what's impacting them. And that lack of knowledge is helping them uh, from progressing further down a, a more positive financial path. I think it's the movement of our time. Our kids aren't educated on this. They're going out and making simple mistakes that put them behind the eight ball. Something like not taking care of your first rental, the property that you rent gives you bad rental rating. It's harder to get one in the future. Things like not taking care of your credit early on can put you behind that eight ball early. Things like getting into $100,000 of student loan debt early. All these things add up and in, in takes many years to recover from. It's not like we could just decide, hey, we want our money to be better now and, and, and we're good to go. It's a lot like fitness, weight loss, anything like that, where it's years of struggling to get Those years, those early years are the most formidable because that's when our when we can save and, and, and grow that money. Uh, we have the best opportunity to grow that money. So I think it starts young. It carries over into the future years. And after you get beat up so many times with your finances, you make a mistake here, you make a mistake there, people get exhausted. So I see a lot of burnout uh, from people, especially now. You know, we had, uh, you know, if we look at the country as a whole, about two thirds are coping or vulnerable, which means they're in a bad situation or barely getting by. Um, and what we see is those people that were there before, now with interest rates higher, inflation, all these other factors that are playing, they just got pushed back down. So it's very difficult and challenging for them. And you are right, income doesn't matter. You know, Bank of America just had an interesting study they put out here recently where 20% of people that make over $250,000 a year are living paycheck to paycheck. That's a scary figure when you're making that much. Um, but again, if we take that down to people that are making less income, the consequences can even be more severe. Part of being financially literate is knowing who to listen to and who not to listen to, right? And that's something you learn over time. Um, and I think in the social influencers, they, they do have a responsibility, right? To make sure that they're putting out good quality information. Um, well, we're seeing the influencers act on two sides. One, you know, we have the uh, influencers that are like the kids unboxing videos, the teen hauling videos. If you're not familiar with those, those are some of the highest viewed uh, YouTube videos out there. Um, and unboxing means a kid will get a new gift, unbox it in front of the camera for people to see. And the teens will go on a haul, meaning go shopping spree and show all their new clothes, whatever they're getting. So we have this negative side of, hey, it's cool to buy. It's cool to have. This is what I need to have this esteem. And then we're also seeing information put out there that may not be based in actual facts. They may not have experience in the financial space. Um, and they're putting out information that can truly harm people in, in the future. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think if we can teach kids how to evaluate people in the quality of information they can get, that'll put them in a situation better select who they listen to. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. 
have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content? Well, visit our website and, of course, all of our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia, financial services, and government as we analyze all the news and events for the week. You're not going to want to miss it. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Tax audits, tax liens, wage garnishments. Every day we hear stories like this about good folks who are simply struggling to pay their bills. Each of them are living a frightening IRS tax nightmare and they are afraid it will destroy their lives. I'm a divorced single mom and my ex-husband left me and the kids with a lot of unpaid bills, including unpaid taxes. I was really starting to show my stress on my kids because the IRS had sent me a letter demanding a huge payment from me. I couldn't afford it. So then the IRS was threatening to garnish my wages. I'm already living paycheck to paycheck. That would have put me over the edge financially. It truly seemed hopeless, but then a friend at work told her to call the tax relief line. The people at the tax relief line, they told me about something called innocent spouse relief. They worked it out so that all of the taxes from my ex are not my problem. I don't know how that works and, and I don't care. All I care about is that I don't owe the IRS a dime and they are not going to take my paycheck. Even if it seems hopeless, you should call the number on your screen right now. There is absolutely no cost for the call or the consultation. You are under no obligation. If you are worried that the IRS could garnish your wages, seize your assets, even take your home, call us right now. The Tax Relief Line is here to help you. Now you have a knowledgeable, professional team of tax experts that are ready to negotiate with the IRS and fight for you to save you money. The Tax Relief Line's professionals have successfully negotiated thousands of cases, reducing and sometimes even eliminating the tax debt for their clients. It's very easy to get started. Simply call the number on your screen right now. You don't have to live in fear anymore. The call and the consultation are free. 